why showrunner writers why are you choosing this path mm -hmm. um and so i just felt like again they're still doing it well but I, this was the one where i was like you don't have to tell the story you think you have to tell We're the good doctors of Abbey Research. I'm Dr. Aaron. Dr. Kristen. You are so very welcome into this little corner of the internets where we are talking about season two of Bridgerton, episode five, An Unthinkable Fate, which is in this episode what Antony tells Kate would be like to be married to her. Uh, he tells her that marriage to her would be an unthinkable fate, which is not a nice thing to say, Antony Bridgerton. Um, but that is where we get the title of this episode. A couple of things happen um, in this episode. We get the revelation that Queen Charlotte is going to host and plan the wedding of, uh, I almost said Kate and Antony, lol, uh, Edwina and Antony that is to take place in a month. We get some delightful scenes of Benedict enjoying his time at art school, including his first day there where he's a little nervous. Um, and then a sex scene later, which is sex between the wrong couple, but okay, naked bums, thank you for that. Um, we get Colin Bridgerton, uh, who is searching for a purpose, which lest you think this is confusing, it is a bit of Colin's shtick to not really know where he is, and we've talked about the lesser... Uh, not lesser, like, actually, but just lower than Antony, the lesser Bridgerton boys and how they struggle with finding an identity as not the head of the family, but also very important people. So Colin figuring out what he wants to do with his life is very much a part of his story. So that's where we get him. Uh, we get some nonsense with the Featheringtons. More and more nonsense, more lies, more fake rubies. Um... And Portia Three times on one page, I wrote, I do not care about the Featheringtons. Three times on one page. Yeah, if you're here for us to talk about uh, the the drums between Portia and Jack Featherington, uh, sorry folks, go with God uh, and go elsewhere. Uh, I'm going to run through that uh, summary real quick. Basically, by the end, we get to the fact where Portia has decided that her and Jack are going to scam the ton by selling them fake gems or the promise of fake gems, real gems that are actually fake. Uh, and we also see that since um, the dissolution of his interest in Cressida Cowper, uh, the Featheringtons are being shunned by the ton, which is detrimental to efforts to now find... Oh, well... Yep. Uh, to get assistance, because um, I was going to say to find someone for um, Penelope to marry, but Portia does not seem concerned with that at all. No, Portia is carrying some serious Elizabeth Holmes energy in this episode, though. It was real. <sighs> yeah, she's Real, not, I wrote, energy. Yeah, I wrote vicious in, like, all caps. Um, so that's the Featheringtons, who's a what's it. Um, we do get a lot of Eloise in this episode. She is lying to her family, sneaking away. Um, because of the pamphlets she's been reading about, like, radical women's issues. She goes to the assembly rooms where she finds the young and handsome printer who we get uh, introduced as Theo Sharp. He wrote the pamphlet that she is uh, been reading uh, ad nauseum. They have a lot of delightful bants back and forth. Um, Penelope is starting to worry about what Eloise is doing in terms of disappearing and, you know, manages to finagle that she was disappearing to Bloomsbury, which is not a safe place in London to be. Um, and then Elle uh, goes back as well to the printer to talk to Theo about his pamphlet. Um, and we get more uh, of their 
ongoing uh, relationship development where it goes. We shall see you by the end of the season. But that's where they're putting our Eloise these days. So that is everything that is not the Sharmas and Anthony Bridgerton <laughs> in this episode. I believe. Oh, we get the. Oh, there's here. one. There's a. There's a great scene between Madame Delacroix and Penelope. Yes. Where Pen says something like, "You know, am I not getting you enough business?" And Madame Delacroix says, "Should there be a limits on a lady's ambition?" Yeah, I loved it so much. I loved what they did with Delacroix in this season, uh, and that they narrowed her scope. Um, I didn't so much care for her and the crazy parties and Benedict storyline in season one. Um, but I love that they're making this point of like, and they're having this conversation with a lot of characters. What does it look like to be a woman in 1813 Regency England? Mm -hmm. And how do you have agency and control and power in a society that wants you to have none of those three things? I mean, even Queen Charlotte. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Even Queen Charlotte as well. Um, and, you know, and arguably all, all the people are trying to find their place, but certainly the show is intentionally having this conversation about women. We also get the reintroduction of the boxing phenom Will Mondrich from season one, which again, I gave zero shits, no offense, Will. I didn't think we were going to come back to you, but... Yeah, he feels really shoehorned in. Yeah. Like, yeah. I don't know why we even have this club or what... Okay. Because yeah. what we what this show really needed was more characters. More characters. More characters. It's very Shonda. It's very mm. Shonda Land to just keep introducing more characters and more plot lines that we have to follow. Uh, it's way more soap opera y than I would want it to be. Um, I stopped watching General Hospital because I got tired of too many storylines. Um, but we do get Will Mondrich. He shows up at the promenade. He's trying to um, gain. Uh, wealthy and fam and well-known patrons for his new club. So that's where we will get him uh, throughout the rest of this season, uh, in and out of the plot in a way that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Okay, so all of that aside, obviously the focus of this episode, as every episode is, is the story of Kate and Antony and Edwina, which we have now established is a love triangle, true and proper. And we get a couple of interesting scenes. Um, the biggest one that we'll, we'll talk about the most, I think, is the dinner that happens at the end of uh, the episode where um, Lady Mary's parents, uh, Lord and Lady Sheffield, show up. And, you know, uh, in, in the British parlance, uh, put a spanner in the works. Um, but we get a couple of hilarious scenes. We get the jeweler is at Lady Danbury's to try and fit... Um, Violet's uh, engagement ring, and we get the tropiest of tropey scenes. Oh my where, gosh, like, I mean, like, you could have just, like, started, like, checking boxes. Yeah, it was a tick box exercise, but I still giggled. Um, Edwina's not here yet. Oh, you and Kate have the same size hands. Let's try it on Kate. Oh, it's stuck on her finger. Hilarious. Um, and we get a lot more in this episode, and we did in last episode as well, between Lady D and Kate in terms of. Lady D just trying to help Kate understand what the what is. Um, and, you know, getting her to be uh, re especially realistic about this now. She's, you know, she has this conversation with her while they're promenading that says, they are all but married in the eyes of the ton. And it would be a great scandal. It would have to be a great scandal that would undo the betrothal. And as you talked about, um... Last episode, when we talked about this, like, Kate, the primary animus of both Kate and Antony is duty and responsibility. So that is exactly what Lady Danbury needed to say to Kate to get Kate to be like, whoa, stop. Um, this is the episode that gives us the much-blessed image of Jonathan Bailey, a.k.a. Antony Bridgerton, getting doused in the lake and then needing to reemerge from the lake in what is, I'm sure, will be many, many a fanfic depiction of that. I've already seen it. I know it's out there. It's a meme. It's fan fiction. It was delightful. I am I am also with the Sharma sisters in ogling Antony Benedict in that scene. Um, or Antony Benedict, Antony Bridgerton. So let's get to the grandparent storyline of this, Dr. Kristen, and I'll bring you in so you can share your thoughts and feelings 
uh, about this, about this sham. Um, uh, Edwina still doesn't know the truth about her grandparents and that she has to marry someone of the British uh, aristocracy uh, and marry well without scandal in order to get money for herself and her family. So that's not, not super good to be uh, still lying to that young human. Uh, we get a lot of Antony and Violet um, talking about their relationship. I will say that I loved Antony and Violet in this se series. Like every scene they had talking about the kind of example he should be for his siblings. Um, and, you know, in this point, she says, if Edwina was to call it off, it would be okay. Like, you can't call it off. But what if she did? Um, and he's like, no, I'm not going to do that because I can't go back on my duty, blah, blah, blah. I can't marry Kate, blah, blah, blah. The Sheffields are coming to dinner. In a very, like, who's afraid of Virginia Woolf kind of dinner party. <laughs> <laughs> it was 12 Angry Men, just, yeah. <laughs> again, with, like, jewelry. Um, also with a delightful oh, appearance by I Anthony know. Stewart Head oh as gosh. the odious Lord Sheffield. It's amazing. Um, I screamed Giles at the television. My mom, uh, who watched Buffy uh, on and off and knew him uh, as Giles, was also like, and the Folgers coffee guy. And I was like, yes, correct. He was the Folgers coffee man um, for a long time. But yeah, um, it, I really loved this scene, actually, for what it did for this story that I don't love um, as much. But it was everything it needed to be in terms of the Sheffields only caring about and being happy to see Edwina. Um, you know, Lady Sheffield is still real bitter about what Lady Mary did in terms of being the diamond of the season and then marrying quote unquote down. Um, and she just starts throwing all the shade at the table at her daughter, at, her, you know, Kate for not even really being a part of the family. And that, uh, that's when Antony explodes, stands up for everybody in quite a wonderful speech. We learned that Lady Mary did not know about Kate's plans. Edwina did not know about Kate's plans. Antony did not know about Kate's plans. It was all just Kate's plan, and she didn't tell anyone about it. Um, everyone is, everyone's mad at Kate. Everyone blames her, because it was all her idea. But we also get uh, yet another scene in yet another library where Antony tells her the much-quoted line, since you are the bane of my existence and the object of all my desires. Which is the greatest encapsulation of an enemies to lovers story arc, as is yep. possible. We get a lot more heavy breathing and sighing, which, much to my chagrin, Dr. K described in the last episode, I have recalibrated and now I am still annoyed but understanding why it's happening. Um, and he says, you know, what kind of marriage would it be if I always wanted you over Edwina? So again, Edwina's in the middle of this and she doesn't know she is, which is just not cool. Which is just not cool. Um, and, uh, you know, later on, um, we have a conversation between Edwina and Kate where uh, Edwina mentions that she's in love with Antony. So that's, you know, that's the other spanner in the works is that now real emotions are engaged for Edwina, not just Antony and Kate. And so Antony and Kate meet in the forest, as you do, and Antony is ready to break off the engagement and Kate ha tells him that they have to keep it. Um, and she does the whole, it's only passion, it'll fade, we have to move up the wedding. Um, and because I, when you're doubting whether or not you should get married, the thing that you should do is fast forward your engagement. Is get married faster. Yeah. When, when you're ready to break off your marriage because you're in love with someone else. Particularly the sister of your betrothed, which is... Not just someone else, but yeah, somebody real specific. The solution is not to, let's get married tomorrow. But, you know, we 
we wouldn't have four more episodes left in the season if they were making rational decisions. And yeah, I, I mean, this episode made me tired. I like, know. The I, last... This one, this one made me tired because it was like, okay, I think to me this is when it settled into, oh, you're really, like, we're going to have a wedding. Like, I, yeah. the, like, oh, shit. You're going to, you're going to leave her at the altar. Like, or, it yeah. became... Like, oh, God, you're not getting out of this in a dignified way. Why? Why, showrunner, writers, why are you choosing this path? Mm -hmm. um, and so I just felt, like, again, they're still doing it well. But I, this was the one where I was like, you don't have to tell the story you think you have to tell. Yeah. And why are you choosing this one? Uh, one other thing is I'll say that the having the string version of You Ought to Know by Alanis Morissette play over their kind of breakup scene is such a level of genius. It's like unparalleled. I can't handle the elevation of the the Vitamin String Quartet songs they commissioned for this season. Because last season it was phenomenal. Like, they became my number one listen to artist on Spotify because I just kept playing Thank Tristan. You Next um, and all the other ones from, from season one of Bridgerton. And, it, like, I was like, they can't top it. Like, they can hope to maybe, like, get to the same level. Y'all, it's phenomenal. We haven't talked about it enough. But, like, like the song that Kate and Anthony danced to later on, like, Dancing on My Own, oh, it's just, Yeah. Yeah, the instrumental only you ought to know, like. I just started, I bust out laughing because I was just like, of the mess you left when you went away, you ought to know. Yeah. Because at the the core of all of this for me is like <laughs> pearl clutching. Think of the children. Think of Edwina. Um, I'm such a big fan of informed choice. Uh-huh. She doesn't have all the data. No. And you guys are pretending that keeping the data from her is a good choice. And is I got a, mad at both of them in this one. Yeah. Like, is a kindness, or it's your duty, or it's good. And I was just like, but she's a human person. Yeah. Like, she is a human person who you proposed to. You understood you needed her consent. But how can she consent when she doesn't have all the information? Yeah. And, and I both, just got yeah. angry. Yeah. I agree with you. And I think, you know... This is obviously just hammering home the point that Antony and Kate make these decisions out of duty and responsibility and that no one asks them to make them. And eventually we get straight up siblings telling them that. So yep. Daphne, you know, tells him on his wedding day uh, in episode seven or eight, I don't remember. Um, Six. Oh, really? Okay, cool. Uh, she tells him, like, you know, we don't respect you. We pity you. None of us asked you to make these sacrifices. None of us asked you to make these decisions for for all of us. You In are fact, the one who determined that this is what it means to be the Viscount. Yeah. Yeah. And that is the whole, like, and that is a huge part of this season. And, like, they had to tell that. I think you can't tell the story of Antony Bridgerton without telling that story. And so they did a good job of doing it. For me, I feel like it was belabored too much yeah. because they changed the timeline of when Kate and Anthony get together. And so it felt very repetitive that we were always going back to this, but we love each other, but duty. Yeah, and I think if they had cut, like, if last episode had happened, and then in this episode they actually broke up and called off the wedding, yeah, fine. Totally. It was that this, this episode was like the, oh, shit, y'all are really doing a wedding. This is so dumb. This is so dumb. This is such a waste of time. Like, yeah, that was where this that feeling settled in for me. Like, I'm not even going to enjoy this wedding because the whole time I'm going to be wondering when does it stop? When does it stop? Yeah. 100 percent. Yeah. Unless they like in some weird world, they went down a path where like they got married and Edwina died in childbirth. Like I was I was starting to 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 write those stories in my head because I was like, what if they go through with the marriage? Like, what? This is not good. Um, but I wrote my last, uh, sentence of my notes for this episode was they Shonda landed the shit out of this storyline to make it more dramatic. Yep. You know, hashtag Bridgerton season two. Um, there was a lot of drama happening. Not all, all of it needed to happen from our opinion, but it did need to happen in order to continue to tell the story they wanted to tell. 
Aside from the well, aside from the Featherington drama, I, that was. I'm I am just gonna go with that was not necessary. Full stop. Yeah. But like you, if you're not gonna have Kate and Anthony get together until the end of episode seven, six, six, you have to go back and forth. Yeah. With like this. this is the episode that is. This is the episode that is could have changed the rhythm of the season. Yeah. And instead it doubled down. And so that's, but like, honestly, his confession in the library, absolute peak of all time where he like leans in and says, tell me to walk away. Like, yeah. and like we, we, we get this a little bit in the book, but we don't get it as explicitly here that, uh, but it's definitely implied that Anthony Bridgerton doesn't know who he is if he's not honorable. No. Um, and we got that in this scene. He didn't outright say it, but he, I mean, he said, I am a gentleman, but that's mm -hmm. what he was saying. I don't know who I am if I'm not honorable and you make me want to not be honorable. And like the thing I wish that we could tease out a little bit more, because in the book, like we get his, his monologue, right? Which right. is nice. But is the idea that what drives him so crazy about Kate is that he's never physically responded to somebody he's also mentally responded to. Yeah. Like in the history of life. Nobody has been smart enough to keep up with him at the same rate that, like, his his body responds to them. Yeah, and he was never And I choosing. wish we could have gotten, like, I wish we could have gotten that in one of his speeches. Like, yeah. I've never met someone like you. Like, that's why she undoes him. Because he didn't think she existed. Yeah, and we get that um, a little bit in season one, but not as explicitly as we do in the book. That he ch all of his sexual partners were never people he was going to marry. Ever. And, and he also believed, because he believed that, like, you know, the greatest harm you could ever cause someone is to, like, marry them and then leave them, um, from his father, that, like, you can't, you can't have both. He was convinced that you can't have both. And, like, in his mind, too, to marry Kate is unkind, because he will die and leave her. Yeah. So to marry Edwina and not ever have her love him, like... In, in a, you know, in episode seven, she's going to say, like, she asks him if he loves her and he is so flummoxed because yeah. he can't fathom why Edwina thinks that's part of this equation. He just keeps bringing it back to business. Yeah. And like at the, at the beginning, like when she accepts his proposal, she says, I will be your Viscountess. And I think Anthony is like someone who gets it. Oh, Ooh, thank God. She gets like, it. Yeah. We get each other. We're, we're on the same page. We're good. We're good. Yeah. We're good. We're truly the people who get each other are Kate and Anthony. And the, pro the both of them have projected a version of Edwina that doesn't actually exist. Yeah. Which then we get, I will say, and I, there's a couple articles going around that like Edwina is the, is the, is the low key um, character of the season. I do think what they did with her from the wedding on was really interesting. And I appreciated that they gave her a lot of depth after she was cast aside, as opposed to just casting her aside. Again, they had a lot to work with because the Edwina in the book is non-existent. Um, she's just, she is just a literal plot device. So I, I do think you know, six, seven, and eight, she's given a lot to chew on, uh, which is interesting. So we'll get into that once we get into the inevitable failed marriage attempt. Well, speaking of that, let's get there. So yeah. we'll wrap up episode five here, and we will see you for the wedding.